<laughs> it's Wednesday, and you're listening to Table Talk. So, Ben, you are a preacher. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, like many preachers, you are the subject to many praises and many uh, criticisms. So uh, we just want to sit down and ask you some questions about your preaching style and and uh, find out why you preach the way that you preach. So uh, why do you preach the way that you preach? I'll reverse the question to you. What do you think my style of preaching is? <sighs> I would say it is a mishmash of I just made up a word hodgepodge mix up of expository preaching and Beninese your own unique uh, on fire style <laughs> uh, so why do I preach the style I preach um, so I guess background wise again I didn't grow up in the church I went to a church that was a really successful church, one of the biggest churches in our community. Uh, I believe that pastor was more of a several verses, more topical. You know, I fell in love with John Piper. I've said it in the last podcast. I fell in love with John Piper, and he was on fire. And he could somehow preach a text in a way that I could follow him through a book. Uh, I mean, even go through the book of Romans for over a year <laughs> and every week to me was riveting because it's a difficult book and I was learning and I was growing um, and uh, and that was happening well when I was in high school when I'm only a couple of years in to this and uh, and I just fell in love with his style of preaching um, so that was kind of the the norm for me is I just felt I got so much more out. I actually learned the Bible from John Piper, whereas I was in church, a mega church, great church, uh, and a church where I really didn't walk away learning to read that book of the Bible for myself. So I guess my number one passion in preaching is to help someone be able to take whatever text I'm preaching, particularly in the context of that book, understand that passage better within its context. Um, mm-hmm. Because I feel the author has a voice. He wrote the letter to a certain people. My job is to figure out who are these people? Why was it written? Why did this person, who is this person? Why did he write it? And what was the purpose of that? And then find and draw all application based on that author's intent. Uh, because it's not my, I take a, a great joy in saying it's not my job to rewrite or to rephrase or to reword or to create my own version of why this matters it's to figure out their intent their version mm-hmm. and then then think through my context in a biblical way that's not changing it's just we're in a different context so my style of preaching would definitely be uh expository it's definitely exegetical i'm pretty verse by verse uh i can get creative sometimes and taking some verses here to, to save time in some ways that's where I feel comfortable, but I also do topical sermons. Some probably would say I'm better at topical preaching than I am even when I'm in my norm of going through a book. But I'm very uncomfortable in topical sermons because I'm always finding verses outside of the context to fit my message. Uh, and within the context, I know it fits, but there's always that risk of just tailor-making a message and picky, you know, cherry-picking verses. So, I don't know. I just, for me... I heard John Piper. He was passionate. He, I learned the Bible from him. It was better than any commentary I've ever read. And I was way before college in biblical languages and studying all the classes I studied. Um, I've learned more actually from a good preacher like a John Piper than I ever did in college in terms of how to preach, how to be a preacher. Um, mm-hmm. And so I go back to that. And uh, my poor wife, when we dated, I'd be putting in CDs of John Piper, and we'd, I, I was doing it strategically. We were driving from here to here, going from here to Galveston or something, and we had a whole hour to listen to John Piper, my unsaved <laughs> girlfriend at the time. We're riding, and we're listening to John Piper. She said, what is wrong with this guy? Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was entertaining to me. Yeah. It was also purposeful, but it worked out for me. I'm a pastor, and she's my pastor's wife. So, 
Um, that's kind of, I guess that would be my my strategy. But to your Beninese, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't think I'm the normal, you know, it's always every person is unique in how they preach. So I have my own style. So. Yeah, now that I think about him, uh, as you were talking, I was, I was kind of thinking, you do preach a lot, like John Piper. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I've noticed there's a there's a commonality between you two in that it's just like, here's a string of thought, but I'm going to insert this new thought and then this thought, and it's pretty interesting to see how similar you are now that I'm thinking about it. It's kind of scary. So now I know why. <laughs> now I know a deeper understanding of why you preach like that. Uh, so you, you've mentioned before uh, in a few of your sermons that understanding doctrine is important. And if you are listening carefully to your sermons, you can tell that you're passionate about doctrine. So why do you, do you think every Christian should know doctrine? And if so, why? I think if you've ever been in the church service with me, within one or two sermons, I'm going to bring up doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's laced in all my sermons. Yeah, I mean, the number one most important thing, evidenced by 15 years of youth ministry, um, where I didn't get the opportunity just to preach and make a decision on a book to preach, I had a purpose of training disciples. And so I spent a lot of time with my fundamentals of a, a Christian needs to know these. If my decision is for them to be able to leave from here, picking a good pastor in the future, picking a good church to be in in the future, knowing the difference between false teachers and wolves and good teachers and shepherds would be uh, the covenants, would be doctrinal teaching, um, you know, that I think is non-negotiable doctrine. Um, and also, uh, you need to understand the gospel and you need to understand it to a, to a depth level that you could explain it to somebody. Mm -hmm. If you can't explain doctrine, if you can't explain the covenants, if you can't explain the gospel, there's a critical problem in your uh, knowledge biblically to be safe in regards to functionally functionally reading the Bible, functionally listening to a person preach, uh, going to a place and making a decision as to who to let be your shepherd. Those are the things that I did in youth ministry, but as a pastor, that's never changed in my heart. Uh, that's the core tenets of you need to know these things um, to be able to function as a Christian and grow as a Christian. So someone might hear your sermon and listen to all the details you go into, the background of the church, the background of the letter, why it was written, who it was written to. Um, you'll go into great depths into, the, into those things and then get into your sermon. Uh, if someone comes along and says, you know, I don't need all that, just tell me what to do, give me the application, how do you respond to that? Uh, I haven't had anyone say that. I can tell it's the least <laughs> favorable part of the sermon. I've heard it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think these letters I've been doing in Revelation, going, Revelation going all through all the history of the cities, it's, it's you can't really honestly do justice to preaching the letters without going into the history because the letter's based on the history. Um, I don't know. I haven't really had anyone say that to me, but I do can tell, like, just give it to me. But I think that has to do with people thinking I preach too long, and uh, I think they're less focused on me preaching what I'm saying and applying it to themselves and being present for the Holy Spirit to do a work in their life. And they're more focused on, i got to get here or do this. i got to go there. Why won't he do this? Like, oh, just be this way. I don't know. Um, so uh, I do that because, to me, again, back to my desire to teach the text, is I want you to know uh, the information you need to get the most out of the text. And sometimes that takes historical information. And so there's, a, there's, there's an attempt by pastors to be super entertaining and there's attempts by pastors to help you understand the text and not to me when I'm doing that I'm trying to say it's not about me it's about these authors and what they said and how they said it so that's my intent in preaching not everybody's intent is that my intent is I want you to for yourself read the word leave from here understanding the text enough because the work of the Holy Spirit does not happen in the church I say it all the time I say it almost every Sunday uh, just this last Sunday, I think I said it like multiple times 
about the book of Sardis, the homework is when you leave from here, letting God do a work based on what was preached. And if you don't do that part, what was the point of being in church? The point is for you to be able to read that text for yourself and the magic, not magic, but the Holy Spirit and God working powerfully, it's when you leave from here, now you go back and look at that. Okay, so I heard it. I now know how to interpret and understand it better. Now the real homework begins. What, is, what are you saying to me? Because the power in any sermon is what is God saying to you? My job is to help you connect to what God wants to say. I can't make you listen to what God wants to say. I can try to give you every single thing you need to help you understand and help you ask the questions, help you just cultivate an environment in which you could receive that word more readily and more easily. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. So uh, with that in mind, how can a person prepare themselves before they come into church? spiritually, mentally, emotionally, to achieve that after listening to a sermon? After or before? How can they prepare before the sermon to live out the message that you've given throughout the week or as soon as they leave, like you're saying? You know, I think I've said this a couple times, too. I think you come expectant, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, particularly if you've got to know the pastor, if you've got to know the worship team, if you've got to know that there's people that are there for your benefit, you know, uh, our worship team, I, you know, I'm paid, I'm a pastor, this is my job. We have a lot of volunteers that put a lot of time into this place because they believe in it, mm-hmm. you know, which inspires me to work hard because I'm like, man, we're in this as a team to do God's work, um, which is what I gave my life to. Like, it's exciting. And I just wish, I say that a lot, I wish people were more prayerful. I wish people were expecting Because if you're expecting and you're asking God to speak to you, you're going to come into a place without, I need to, I'm worried about, I need to go here, I need to do this. Or you're going to come in without all those distractions, everything that's going to keep you from what God. Because again, your job coming into the congregation and coming into the service is to say, God, what are you saying to me? I mean, I, whatever I've prepared, I don't know what I've prepared. And I kind of have a, you know, people get upset at me because I don't preach like one point. I preach like five points. Like, why do you preach so much material? Why do you preach so many points? Because what I've found is if I preach one point, it doesn't hit very many people. When I go boom, 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 I can ask literally people, what did you get out of the sermon? It's totally different per person. And so the more points I hit, the more people are affected because they needed this, they needed this, they needed this. I don't know who or what this is for, and I don't know what the Holy Spirit might say. If you come in already, I'm tired, I don't want to be here, i got to be here, you're just going through the motions, and I don't think church is for that. And that's not to say you don't come. The point is, if you come expecting, you will receive. If you come saying, God, I want to hear your voice, God will speak. And the more we come, and, and that, let me say this, it's no different than reading the Bible on your own. No different. If you come to God's Word praying and asking God to speak, you will receive God internally saying this. If I'm looking at the Bible and saying, what, what, what command do I need to follow? What, what truth do I need to believe? What encouragement do I need to receive? And I read God's Word expecting the voice of God to speak. He speaks. So church is no different than reading the Bible for yourself in that way. I just get an opportunity to make it a little easier or to explain it or to have given you something that I chewed on for an entire week. But that's why I try to focus on a text and say, hey, this is our concentration this week. Boom. And then I try to say, on your way out, please take this and let God speak to you after this because it's all about God speaking. So preparing yourself for him to speak. You leave, let him speak. Because in the moment, there's too much going on. There's, you're, there's too much information, too much talk, too many distractions, which is why I hand out sermon notes. You can walk out of here, take the sermon notes. You can't remember everything, but those can give you like some pointers to, oh yeah, he said this. Oh yeah, the Holy Spirit was kind of, There was some sort of connection where God was saying something about this. So then I'm hoping people will dig into that and say, God, what were you trying to say? That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So, like many pastors over the years, I think you said you've been here for four years now, uh, you will get complaints about length, uh, 
Ben, you need to preach shorter. Ben, preach less. How, 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 would, should, how do you respond to those uh, comments? Usually I say nothing. Uh, well, how, so the person said, how do you respond now? <laughs> the person said to me 15 times in a row, I may snap back. <laughs> but uh, I genuinely, uh, I just don't care. Say it that way. Your afternoon engagements, your I need to get to lunch on time, your I've got other things, it already shows me your, your initial question of, or just the last question. How do you come prepared? If you were coming prepared to receive the word of God, you wouldn't be so focused on everything else. Because we sit through a Netflix series. I have not once preached over an hour. <laughs> we watch shows all day long and we entertain ourselves all day long, but God's word and God's presence and God's church can't go over X time. And what happens, I've learned, is once it starts with time length and then it turns into how you preach, your style of preaching, how you are, and it becomes really quickly just judgmental and it becomes a preference. And um, for me, I know this. Um, I take a text. I actually, it's one of my failures as a pastor. I don't look four weeks, five weeks in. Um, I don't have a repertoire of past sermons that I re-preach. Every week is fresh, it's new. Every week, I actually my staff knows this, Mondays are the worst days for me because I don't wanna work and I can't get my mind settled on what to preach. And so I spend all Monday and Tuesday saying, God, what do I preach? Uh, if I'm in a series, it's so much easier because <laughs> I know what's next. But even that section next, I have to say, okay, so how do I preach? What's the angle? What, what are you saying to me? I could read that text all day long, but I need inspiration. I don't function well without inspiration. God's got to say, this is the point. This is where I'm leading you. Um, and then when I get excited, all of a sudden I can, I can actually knock out a sermon in an hour once I get that inspiration. Um, but the journey for me as a pastor is, what do you want me to say? And until God says, this is what I want you to say, and there's this hurdle of prayer, time, of saying, okay, I'm not excited yet, Lord. I'm not energetic. Like, I don't feel like this is what my people need to hear. There's just kind of back and forth between me and God for a period of time. And um, uh, so lengthwise, I just don't worry about it because whatever I've put together, I know 100% the Holy Spirit led me in that writing process, in that constructing what I'm going to say. And there's a good chance from Thursday to Sunday it has changed because I've had three more days to pray about it, think about it, chew on it, think, you know. And uh, so that's kind of my answer to that is, you know, as long as I am Holy Spirit inspired, as long as I'm coming in, I'm not lazy. I'm not like just trying to preach to get it over. It's not a job to me. It is a job. I paid for this. I'm a pastor. But it's not, that's not why I'm in this. Like this is. This is a God calling. I believe in it. Anything I say, I put my name by it. I put my name to it. Anything said that's wrong biblically, I would be 100% okay with someone saying, I don't think that's what the Bible preaches. I would say, hey, let's talk. Because that's my whole job is to preach the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit lead me. Uh, but there's a journey that takes place every Sunday uh, between me and God that those comments... Uh, honestly just become a discouragement and just become a, uh, a, a useful tool to make me feel bad about who I am or what I do. And so, again, there's criticism. People say, this, you should preach this way or this way. It's an unending cycle of, who sh again, who should you be for whom are you talking to? And everyone has different opinions. Uh, at the end of the day, we talked about this in our last podcast. I listen to John Piper. I listen to J David Platt. I listen to Matt Chandler. These guys preach the same length that I preach. And I don't care. Like, I love it. It's engaging. It's Holy Spirit filled. It's, it's, but, I'm, but I've already gone into their sermons saying, I want this. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the same as our church is all the comments is you're not focusing on why you're here. And it's not wrong that you think that way. But at the end of the day, you can't fit a person or, you know, whatever into a box that you desire. Preferences are going to be a million. And if you listen to everybody, you're just, you're going to lose who you are and who God's made you to be. 
So that's my response there is I do know the work and my wife knows <laughs> the work that goes into every single Sunday. So, and it's not me. It's, it genuinely is like, I, that's my, that's my weakness is I'm week to week. I need to be month in advance, but I, I really do have to focus on this week to get a message across. It doesn't mean I can't have vision for a month. It just means this week, every week is a new <laughs> God. So. I would imagine if you're getting multiple comments from multiple people, it'd be very entertaining to watch them uh, contradict each other. And this person says you need to do it this way, and this person says you don't need to do it this way. And it, that'd be a lot of fun, I would think. Um, Most of it goes down to service needs to be 30 minutes. <laughs> so Yeah, I've never understood that complaint. I guess I can kind of understand some other ones or at least wrap my head around them. But the, the link thing, you know, it's it just comes down, to, you know, do you want to hear from God? Do you like God's Word? Do you love the Bible? I mean, anyway, well, so but that's here, how I feel here, So the, it goes back to style of preaching. People we just mentioned that I listen to are exegetical preachers. Mm-hmm. To do the work of exegetical preaching, it takes more time. Oh, yeah. So if I just have two verses and I have a message and I have four points, cool. But that's not actually teaching a text. So Mm -hmm. if I actually have to teach a block of text, 16 verses, it's substantially more into it than two verses, four points, see you later. So it's style of preaching, which is why it's funny that the guys I listen to go longer than some of the people that don't go as long. Yeah, some of the guys you mentioned, they have like hour and a half sermons. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So, so that's why I'm like, I'm okay. I have the preach as long as that. 55 minutes is fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's my longest. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. <laughs> Thanks for sitting down with us. It's pretty. <laughs> Lord, thank you for our church. Thank you for uh, Chris asking these questions. Um, Lord, we just want you to be lifted high um, amongst all Sunday school teachers, community group leaders, pastors, Sunday school, out in the children's buildings and youth buildings. We just want your word to be proclaimed. Uh, That is the goal. And so, Lord, I pray that that we would just honor you in um, every way as we um, seek and study and and just want to hear your voice uh, as we communicate but at the same time lord as we preserve the truth of your word thank you for our church thank you for the leadership in this church and god i pray that we would just be uh, on fire for you amen